It looks like our numbers are still trickling in just a little bit, but I'm going to get started. Thank you so much for being on time. Really appreciate that. Welcome to introduction to the 2024 MCAS Alt. You are in part A of the core concepts. And you should be here if you haven't done an MCAS Alt or if you haven't done one in like five years. Okay, so that's who should be here. This is what we'll be starting with today. It looks like a long list. We may not get to number seven, data charts and brief descriptions. Um, we'll see how it goes, but we'll, we'll end uh, most likely on selecting a skill for the measurable outcome. But this is just to give you an idea of what our morning looks like together. We have an hour and a half to get everything done. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, number one, everyone is on listen mode. We do have a Q&A button, but I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until we have those designated question breaks. What we have found is that folks get so um, concerned about things that when they put a question in, they wait for the answer and then that sparks someone else. And next thing you know, you've missed five or six slides that I've probably already answered your questions. So I've asked, uh, we have this wonderful group of um, teacher consultants. We have um, Patty Sprano, Diane Costello, Sheila Chamberlain, Laura Hines. They're all behind the scenes and they're going to be answering your questions, but not until we have that break. So you can put the questions in there, but they're not going to be answered. Okay, so unless you can't hear me, unless there's a technical issue, um, please jot your questions down or put them in there, but know that they're not going to be answered yet. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available in, within a week to 10 days. We have to send it out and get it professionally closed caption, clean it up, and then get it posted um, on our website. And we'll show you later on uh, where that is, but we also have it here for you. If you accidentally close out a Zoom while, I, while we're presenting, you can just click that same link. So today is part A and part B. Part B will be this afternoon at 1.30. And for this part, we'll be doing MCAS Alt for language, reading, and math. So all of ELA and the math. We have two separate sessions, one on ELA writing and one on science and technology. And that's because they have different requirements and we don't want to confuse you because you are new. We want to just focus first on the ELA reading, language and math. And then you come to, if you haven't already signed up for the writing, um, we have one tomorrow and then um, it, we also record those. And then we have science and tech engineering, and that's for teachers who have students in grades five, eight, or high school that will be taking the alternate assessment. So I start with this one about the security just to get it out of the way. It isn't really a pleasant thing to talk about, but we do need to discuss it. So I want to make sure that you are all aware that we take the security of the MCAS alt as strongly as MCAS does. So we want to make sure that the evidence that you're giving us truly portrays your student. It's authentic, it's accurate, it's not fabricated in any way or altered. It must represent the student's unique abilities, no matter how similar their activities are, because each student is going to have various um, accuracy and independence. Also, if we do find an issue, um, just know that your principal has signed off on these binders saying that they are all of these things, that they are accurate, that they are authentic. And so we contact your principal, the superintendent, and we do a fact-finding investigation into irregularities. So I, my very first piece of advice is to start early. Don't get behind. That's what happens. That's when people do silly things that get them in trouble. Stay on top of this. It seems like you have a long time, but 
it's it does go quickly especially once the after the winter break hits so please start tomorrow so what is the purpose um i think most of you have heard enough about this between you you've lived through mcas maybe some of you have actually taken mcas and mcas all but why do we assess students with the most significant cognitive disabilities well first of all it is the law all students who are educated with massachusetts funds are required to participate in the statewide assessment that means there's no opting out and since the alternate assessment is embedded in daily instruction it's pretty hard to opt out also, we want to make sure that these students who are difficult to assess are, account are accounted for. We want to make sure that we're getting the resources we need for these students. And all does mean all. We want to determine that our students are getting the instruction that's based on the curriculum frameworks, even if it's alternate access achievements standards. And last but not least, we want to provide these students with challenging and standards-based instruction, and that's going to be based on data and evidence. We want to raise the bar as high as we can for our students. So let's talk about what's required for your student. And here is a, the first helpful hint. In the corner, you'll see an educator's manual pages. Um, at one point, and I forgot to introduce Kevin, I'm so sorry, Kevin is our contractor. He is with Cognia, and he's going to be showing us all the places that we can get our materials and how to do our forms and graphs. So he's going to show you where the educator manual is located. And this little box up here will tell you what pages you can find these on. So when you go to the educator's manual, it'll have each and every grade laid out for you. For, so each grade has their assessment. I'm just going to kind of give you a high level view for ELA because everyone who's doing ELA for grades 3, 8, and 10, they're going to do one reading strand, just one, and they're going to choose either informational or literary text. You're also going to do one language strand. Now you're going to use a program called Forms and Graphs. It's online and it'll take you right to the correct cluster heading, but just know that the cluster heading, which is just a topic, is for vocabulary acquisition and use. That's what we're gonna focus on in language is vocabulary acquisition. Each of those strands are gonna include a data chart and two pieces of evidence for each strand. And don't worry, we're gonna go over everything I'm talking about. You're gonna include text titles on the data chart for the reading strand. But again, I'm going to talk about all of these things separately. The ELA rate writing, remember I said that I want you to sign up and because there's a separate one just for writing because it does have unique requirements. Now, this is a little different for grades three through eight. Again, our educator's manual is up here. And you'll see for three through eight, you have two different domains to do. These are for grades three, you'll see measurement and data, operations and algebraic thinking. Now I won't go through each one. As I said, you can go to the educator's manual, manual look at grade five and see what you need to do. There's, but just remember that there's two maths that you're going to do. And each math is going to have one data chart and two pieces of evidence. So that's grades three through eight and you'll have two domains to do. If you are teaching high school, you will have three conceptual categories. That's what they call these for the math. There's five of them there, and you're going to choose, you get to choose which three you want, okay? That's also going to include one data chart and two pieces of evidence for each of those categories, okay? So if you want to do geometry, statistics and probability, and number and quantity, those could be your three. Each one of those has a data chart and two pieces of evidence.
for grades five, eight in high school, you need to be doing science. So we have one tomorrow at October 4th, where we will do a separate presentation on how to do the science. Let's talk about the forms. I like to do this form, the this one, because this really is something you can get done. Um, five out of the six you can get done within this week. It's only Tuesday. And so we have things, we have an artistic cover. So that's something the student can do on their own. They can do it on the computer. This is optional, but it's always a good way to get the student um, invested in this assessment. This is their work. You can use any binder before you get the one that we send you. So this goes just in the front, so it's their cover. But again, it can be anything that you want it to be. Then we have a student introduction. This really helps us to get to know the student and helps them as well. It can also, hint, hint, be one of your writing um, pieces. You could have the speech and language person work with them to, to help do this. They can, they can tell, they can do pictures to talk about things they like, what they do at home, um, if they have a favorite pet, all of those things. Sometimes at scoring, we'll see um, something that's been written to the scorers, like dear scorer, I hope you like my um, my portfolio. I did hard work. It's it's just very lovely to have that. And it gives us a little insight as to who they are. Next is a school calendar. You can get this at the front office. I'm sure you can find them. You're just going to put that in the left-hand side of the binder. Then we have the MCAS Alt cover sheet. And Kevin's going to click on that and show you here is what it looks like. So this one is for Michael Scott, and you can see it has the demographics. It has a the SACID, which is very important that you use the correct numbers for their SACID. That's what we're looking for. And then the student's grade. Again, we'll talk about how important that is. And all of this information here. Okay, you'll fill that out. That can be done. That can be done on your break when you leave here today at 1030 or it can be done uh, during the week, but it's very quick. Thank you. The only one here that can't be done is this verification form. So I'm going to come back to that in one moment. But here is the video for, um, uh, it's a form for the forms and graphs. No, <laughs> it's not a forms and graphs, my apology. It's for the consent form for photo and videos. So if you think you're going to take pictures, you need to get a separate form signed by the parents. This is not that blanket form that you have at the beginning. This is um, strictly for the MCAS alt. You keep it at school. I don't need it, but please make sure if you're taking pictures that you uh, get it signed. And last but not least is the verification form. This can't be done until the whole assessment is completed or 99% completed. And you want to have the parents come in and view it. Now, if they can't come in and view it, you can send a copy home. Please don't ever send the original just because you need it. But you can send a copy. There's nothing secure there. This is their child's work. They are free to work. look at it. If they are parents who maybe work, can't come in, um, don't usually respond to you, all you're going to do is document that on that form. And you'll find all these forms in a program that Kevin's going to show you in a moment. So I'm going to turn this over to Kevin and he will go through all of these forms for you. So take it away. Thank you, Deb. Um, so in the chat, I'm dropping in two links. One of them I put in, um, if you came late, you might not have seen it, um, but one of them, and I'll show you these sites in, in just a second. One of them is where all of the materials for this session and some other um, sessions are posted, and then a link to the DESI site. 
Um, so in order to show you forms and graphs, we kind of have to take one step back and build up to, to logging in there. Um, so let me, um, I need to change computers. So give me one second um, and I'll, I'll switch over and the PowerPoint will go away and I'll walk you through some of these websites. So one moment. Okay, so on the screen now, you should see this is Desi's site, and specifically, it's the MCAS alt section um, of the MCAS section and then the resources page. It's a good one to bookmark. This is that first link that I dropped in, beginning with doe.mass.edu. Um, and what you'll find on here, um, some of the things Deb has talked about already, the resource guides, the educator manual lives here. There is a separate, we have administrator trainings, and we tell them that they have their own manual. Never a bad idea to point out if they don't come to those, that there is a separate manual just for MCAS alt. Um, usually referred to in, in schools sometimes as the PAM, the Principal Administration Manual, um, particularly for MCAS, but there is one for MCAS alt. It just lives right here. Um, the newsletters, um, anything that comes out throughout the year will get posted to this page, the resources page. We have email addresses for you now when you registered, so you'll automatically get the newsletter, um, typically about every other month. Um, sometimes sooner, sometimes we stretch it out a little, but whenever it, it's meaningful to put out a newsletter with information, it should just come right to your inbox. And then as we scroll down, um, trainings are all here. You figured this one out, but if you miss the flyer, they do go to schools, they do go in the newsletter, but the flyer will always be posted here. Um, remember this is here. I, I wouldn't try to follow along um, in forms and graphs, just watch me as I demo it uh, of how you do it. Because if you try to do it as well in real time, um, I have to move a little, little bit to get through what we need to get through. So you'll, you'll get behind. Um, again, this is being recorded and I'll show you where you can get those recordings in, in just a, a moment here. But know that forms and graphs um, at the very bottom of this DESE resources page is where you can click to, to link and then bookmark that site as well. The other link I dropped in there, is so these are all not just intro all the sessions we're doing all the information is here uh, but the recordings so everywhere you see it coming soon um, those will be replaced with the link it'll actually take you to the desi's youtube page is where these officially get posted uh, but there will be a link here that you can click on um, once we get them captioned and, and posted on on the desi page uh, so come back to that training link that i put in the chat um, in about a week or so, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, and all these coming soon should be live links for you. PowerPoint slides. Uh, this one is a decent one. I can post this separately in the chat too. We'll, we'll be building a strand um, as a demonstration uh, just to show you. I'll click on it real quick. So it's just a complete strand for Alex Keaton, math number operations in base 10 for a grade five student. So that again is um, third one down in that core concept. So we'll be looking at that kind of throughout the day in both parts A and B today of, of how, how we created that strand um, using forms and graphs. But everything's here. If you need the resource guides and manuals in PDF, um, they are posted in Word on Desi's site. You can grab the PDF if you don't have Word. Um, Google Docs will open it, but it does some funny formatting things. So if you need a PDF, you can grab them right from these materials as well. Um, but let's get into forms and graphs. So forms and graphs profile known by many names. So this is the program that um, is created for you to create all the stuff that goes into the binder. Um, so those cover sheets Deb was talking about, the verification forms. And then as we start to create a strand, all the components of the cover pages and the, the graphs and the description labels, all of that is created using this, this website called Forms and Graphs. As a new user, once you get to this page, um, you don't have an account assigned to you. You just need to create one. It's just an open-ended website. Um, so when you come to this site, the first thing you do is create a, a, a registration for a new account. So you go to registration page. And it just wants two pieces of information, a unique email address that acts as your username and a password. Again, of your choosing, not looking for a password. Nothing was assigned to you just like any other website you're, you're signing up for, for a basic account, your username, email address, uh, and then a password. Just has to be at least eight characters. Um, uh, and click Submit Registration. It'll create the account for you and log you in for the first time. I've already got 
a sample going. So I'm just going to log in. And when you log in, the first thing you're going to see is this my account. You technically don't have to fill this out. You can skip over it. But a nice feature of this site is whenever it needs a piece of information that you've already supplied, it'll just populate that for you. So if you give it your name, your school name, um, the basic information, um, if you're doing multiple students, then you don't have to keep retyping that on every um, cover uh, MCAS alt cover sheet. It'll just populate it for you. So you can put your name, district name, school name, And then address, of course, real information, um, all stuff that you, you probably basically know. The one that throws people sometimes is when they get down to district and school code. Uh, so technically, and if you just ask your front office, anything to do with MCAS, any integration that they have of ordering materials and rolling kids, it's always the same district and school code for your um, school. And it's looking for um, what it is as assigned by the state. So the DESI recognized SIMS based school and district code. So the district code is always four digits. And then the school code is always eight digits. And the first four of that eight digit is always the district code. And then you'll have four more. Um, don't worry about it. If you if you don't know the official ones, it's okay to leave it blank. This isn't going to file up to be reported or anything. Um, it's just trying to compile some basic information. So if you know your, your assigned four-digit district code and eight-digit school code, just put them in. And if you don't, just ask anybody that has anything to do with MCAS, and they should be able to, to fill you in on, on what those are. Um, but if you only get that eight-digit code, just know that the first four are always the district code. So in this case, one, two, three, four. So basic my account stuff. You can scroll down on this page. Um, you can change your password here if you want to, where nobody ever goes until they have to, because they're freaking out, <laughs> is down at the bottom here. If you accidentally delete a student along the way, and I'll show you where those students live in a student list as you create them, there is an opportunity to delete them. Uh, we're not so cruel that we just delete them from existence and everything you've done is gone. We're just hiding it from you, um, from your active student list. Um, and it'll show up here and you can click um, restore, undelete, and it'll put them back as it was. People love to accidentally delete right in March, right when they're due. They're just rushing through for final looks and they they call panicked and I'm their hero to say, oh no, you can bring that right back. Um, so if you do it, um, just know you can come to this My Account page scroll right to the bottom and they'll just be hanging out here. You can bring them back. There are a few hard deletes in the actual strands, um, which I'll point out along the way that there is no bringing back if you accidentally delete, but a whole student worth of work we're just hiding from you um, from an active list. Um, so hopefully you don't need it, but that's where it is if you, if you did it accidentally. So this red bar underneath the profile logo, so Things will come and go here, so it'll act as a navigation bar for you or interact with a feature on a particular page. Um, but where we start to begin to actually create materials um, to do the assessment um, begins by creating students. So we're going to do my student list. And it's important to remember, even if you tell it what your school is, this is an open system. It's not tied into SIMS. It doesn't know a roster from your school. It will only populate what you tell it to. Um, a nice bonus of that is, is in addition to your real students, you could put in a fake student in here as just a, a sample tester, just to click around and get a feel for it, and then just delete it out when you don't want it anymore. Um, no harm in doing that because it's completely open, but don't, don't expect it to try to find the students in your school. You're just supplying um, the students that you want to add. And how you add them is first click here to add a student, and this blank student list will now populate the placeholder for a new student. This is the delete I was talking about. So if I do click this X, it does say, are you sure, which nobody reads. They just click OK and away it'll go. Um, but all it does is move that to that list. You can bring this right back to your student list um, if you accidentally delete that student here. But that's that's the button that causes them to go away from this list and cause panic. But just remember that my account, it's just hanging out there. So to begin building a student, 
one second. So we can click select student. And Deb showed you um, in, when she was looking over the basic forms, the cover sheet. So here's an example of the cover sheet. And, and whenever possible, the site will offer up the, the form in the way it looks of, of what it is you're trying to create. So this is laid out just like the cover sheet that you, you put in into the binder when you're done. Um, the logical place to start, uh, every new student gets this generic new student in there. So supply a real name. And remember, we're just going to rebuild that Alex Keaton sample. So my childhood hero, Alex P. Keaton. Uh, so Alex Keaton. And then we come to SASID. This is another one that catches people. Sometimes we see some four or five digit codes in here, which I assume are local student IDs. This is looking for the official SASID in SIMS as assigned by DESI, um, each and every student. Um, that is associated with a Massachusetts school uh, has a SASID. Um, and the easy way to remember it is it's a 10 digit number that begins with one zero. So one zero and then eight other digits. And that's the SASID. Um, you can, uh, every IEP should have it. Um, again, anybody that has to do with rostering for MCAS can probably look this up for you if you don't know what it is. Um, um, but that's what that's looking for. Make sure you're doing a 10 digit number uh, that begins with one zero. That's the official SASID. And you'll notice we'll skip over grade and come back to it because it's extremely important. Um, notice lines four, lines five, line six. Um, it did those for me. I don't have to type this in, which you're, you're only doing one. It's no big deal. But if you're doing four, five, six or more, it'll save you some typing. It'll fill out a decent chunk um, of the cover sheet for you. So let's scroll back up and look at grade again. So you get one shot at grade. This is a bit of a hard rule. There's this big red box that most people ignore. Um, but what it's trying to tell you is once you select this grade, and you lock it in there, um, and you save it and leave this page, you can not change it. I've We've already got one request this year of somebody that um, put it in a wrong grade and was wondering if they can change it, and you cannot. It seems like a hard, arbitrary rule, but the, the reason why is after you leave this page, a whole bunch of filtering takes place. So the site will only offer you up the appropriate strands for that grade, um, and in math, every grade level has at least two distinct strands that are required for that grade for two different domains. Um, so if you were grade four and then want to change it to a grade five, now you've opened up the door to have mismatched strands. You, you could do something that's not appropriate for the grade that you're in. So it gives you one shot, locks it in, and you cannot change it after. The only fix is to start over. Um, so don't don't be that poor person that doesn't realize it until they're too far in and start to do the math and realize, hey, these aren't these aren't the strands I I need for the grade I'm in, um, and it's because you put the wrong grade in. So be very very careful. We know looking at our Alex sample, he's a grade five, and as long as I'm on this page and haven't left it yet, I can save. I can still get it here if I realized it was the wrong. But as soon as I leave this page. Um, so let's go back to my student list, and here's Alex. And when I select this student, and I go to the cover sheet, which is where we just were, notice the drop down is gone. So when I come back, it is now locked in. Cannot change it. Um, you can click on it all you want; it will not change. It's now just a label on the page. It's just text. Um, so because now the filtering is once I left that page, it has populated things in the background. Uh, to tie learning standards to this grade, to tie appropriate strands to this grade. Um, if you're five, eight or high school, then it allows science to show up. Um, so very, very important um, that you get that grade right because you get one, one real shot at it. <clears throat> so the other forms Deb was mentioning, you can find all those in table of contents. We'll come back where you'll spend 99% of your time is these top sections. So we've seen the cover sheet. Um, and after Deb explains the components of what goes into a strand, we'll come back here and I'll show you how to build skill surveys and strands. So don't, so don't worry about those right now. Um, but everything else, uh, so that verification form of getting the sign off by the parent or at least logging your attempts, there's not a whole lot you need to do here. They're just here for you to be able to, in most cases, print them out. Um, and either get a signature or keep at the school. Um, so you can 
click on it and you'll see this is the verification form of where the parent can sign and date and check off or you can leave um, a note of the attempts that you've made. If, um, some, some, unfortunately, sometimes you just can't get a parent to come in, um, but you want to document that you at least made the effort here um, and then include that in without the signature. But anything in here across the site that the intent is that it is going to be printed out and interacted with in printed form will have this printer friendly in this red bar. So when I click that, It'll open a new tab, strip away everything it doesn't eat, and give you a version that you can print cleanly on a uh, eight and a half by eleven piece of paper. So this is what you would print to have the parent sign, or um, if you can't, you'd print it and put it right in the front of the binder um, of the attempts that you made to to get that sign off. So that's the verification form, and then if you are doing videos or photos, um, that consent form um, here is included again doesn't need to go in the binder that's just kind of a, a blanket sign off if um, you're going to um, and the incidental is if you're taking photos of a class you obviously if you're going to take photos of other kids as well you need to get sign off that you're including them as well but those again are not a whole lot to do you're just sort of giving you a place to access them to print them out and put in the binder so this top core content is again, where we'll spend most of our time looking at how to build strands, um, but I'm gonna give it back to Deb and she'll start to lay out the components of um, using the resource guide and measurable outcomes and all the things that go into a strand. And then we'll come back and I'll show you how to do it here of how we built that Alex strand um, that we've started to, to build out. So back to you, Deb. Thank you, Kevin. That was very in depth, I appreciate that. So while Kevin's giving us back the PowerPoint, I just want you to take a breath. It's a lot of information that we're throwing at you. And the other thing I just want to remind you is that this is a repeat of last week. So for those of you who came again thinking, oh, this must be something else I have to do. It's not. This is the same exact um presentation well i can't say exact because i never do anything the same twice but it's it's pretty much the same as what i did last week so i just want you to know that and i just want you to relax there's a lot of information it is recorded you get to go back to it you get to ask questions i think i forgot to tell you who i was i'm deborah hand so you'll probably be emailing me the teacher consultants are available. We have review sessions. So you're not alone in this, okay? It's a lot, a lot to take in. So sit back and just absorb as much as you can. Write down any questions you have and we will promise to get there, okay? So let's talk about how we're going to assess these students. So we have this document and it used to be just called the resource guide. It is actually, and always has been, the alternate academic achievement standards to the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. And this is for students with disabilities. This is a great tool. I used to give this tool, this document to my general ed um, colleagues because you always have those low students and sometimes you just don't know how to um, get them. How do, you, how do you access some of these skills? So the resource guide, incorporates the content standards from ELA, math, and science. And this will help you, um, number one, for the alternate assessment. You're going to use this as a guide. But even if you're not doing an alternate assessment, like next year, say you don't have anyone, this is a wonderful tool because it breaks down and unpacks those standards. And that's what we've done. We work very closely with our content people, and they help us to unpack each and every standard. And if you've seen some of those standards, how complicated they are, and they break them down into smaller chunks. So we'll look at those a little more carefully, but I would like to know, and we're going to just give you a quick poll. I would appreciate it if you just take a moment to participate in it as to how many of you have either seen the resource guide, like in the past, or even used it. So if you could just take a moment 
and answer this, I would be greatly appreciated. So thank you for participating. Um, I think it looks to be, um, yeah. So we do have about 39% of you have seen it, but more than half have not. So that's good. Thank you for, for um, participating. So we're going to take a look at, oh, did I, <laughs> sorry, I was supposed to share that. So this is what it looks like as a paper version. This is how we navigate the resource guide. Most people today will use it digitally. They don't print it all out unless you want to just print the area that you're working on. I personally print it out because I like to mark it up and kind of turn the pages and see where I am. But I know that digitally is the way we need to go. So let's start with the very top. It's the content area is math. We want to make sure we're in the right content area. And that next level is called a domain. That just tells us what we're in. So we're in number and operations base 10. I'm at grade five. And then we have a strand. And so the strand is exactly a group of standards that's just organized around that number and operations in base 10 for this one. So it's a, around one theme or concept. That's what the strand or domain is. Then on the side, you'll see these things we call cluster headings. They're like topics. And those cluster headings, they're just a smaller group of those related standards. So you see over here, standards 5NBTA1 through A4 are all under that cluster heading, understand the place value system, okay? And then we have the standards, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the standards. That's a statement of what all students should know and be able to do by the time they leave that grade. But for our students, that doesn't happen. Most of the time, they aren't able to access the standard as written. So this is where the magic really happens. This is a sample of our entry points and access skills. So you'll see on the top, it says exactly that, entry points and access skills. And in this case, it's number and operations in base 10 in kindergarten. Well, wait, we were at just at grade five. Well, this is the beauty of it. You may have a student that is in grade five, but it's too challenging, even the entry points at grade five. So you have to keep spiraling back until you can find the entry point that meets your student's needs. Now I'll show you something that's gonna help narrow it down for you, but for now, just know how this works. These are the entry points where that blue is outlined. Those are the entry points. And these entry points are what I talked about, those outcomes or the activities, the skills that are based on the actual standards, but at a lower level of complexity. So you can see at the top, there's a, an arrow from more complex to less complex. And that helps you to see where you're going to go with these um, entry points. You as a teacher are going to choose these. You as a teacher are going to determine that level of your student's need. You're not going to say, oh, I think they're working at a first grade level, so I'm going to go to a first grade level. No, you're always going to start at the more complex and then review the entry points and spiral down to where you can find um, an entry point that will meet your students' needs. So here's a highlightable moment. Entry points form the basis of a measurable outcome in each portfolio strand, and that's for language, reading, and math. So I'm just going to say that one more time. Entry points form the basis of the measurable outcome in each portfolio strand. Then we have these access skills. So access skills, you'll see those are a little bit 
different if you can read them. I know it's very small. But access skills are students who are working on developmental skills. Those are communication or motor skills. These are still addressed during a standards-based academic activity, and they have to still be in the content area that your student is being assessed. These are always found at the lowest grade level in each strand or domain. So we're gonna take a look at that a little more carefully. Here's an example of what it looks like. Here's the standard as written. So that would be that first page we looked at at grade five, but this is a grade six. And you can read all of the things that a grade six student should know before they leave about extending number lines, coordinated accesses. Um, on the, they have to find previous grades to represent points on the line in the plane with negative number of coordinates. That's a standard as written. That's a lot to absorb and maybe um, a lot for your students. I know it'd be a lot for me. And so we want to find something. What can my student do to access that skill? So I'm going to go down. I'm going to spiral down to the next level. The next level says they're going to determine the coordinates of points plotted on a coordinate grid. And that can be from any quadrant. Maybe my student can do that. I'm not really sure. I have to check that out. But I don't think so. So I'm going to go a little bit further down. My student, can they add and subtract numbers from one and two digit, from whole numbers? Hmm, maybe, but maybe not. I got to go down another one. I go to match visual representation of simple fractions to the fraction itself. Now, this is just a small example of what's available. Excuse me. This is just a small example of what's available. So there's a lot of different entry points, but these are students that are able to make choices. Maybe they can add, but they have to have manipulatives. That's all well and good. They can do that. So you have to determine, and we'll show you our skill survey, but you have to determine which entry point works. Down here, we talked a little bit about access skills. These are not just a low level entry point. Access skills are for a separate group of students. These students are going to be tracking the objects. And we'll get into this a little bit more. But in this case, if I had a student that was doing um, this standard, they would be tracking an object as it was added or subtracted from a set you'll see that the student is not adding or subtracting. The student is tracking the object, very different from adding or subtracting numbers, okay? So let's go one more and talk a little bit about this because this is difficult to understand because we all know our students are working at such a low level. There, some of our students are not working as low as you may anticipate. So for students with only emerging symbolic communication skills who are addressing early developmental milestones, so they're responding to stimuli, grasping objects. Think about your, if you have a child or you worked with a very, very little one, they would be, you know, looking, we're trying to get them to track an object going from left to right, holding on or releasing. That's the type of student we're looking at here. But these access skills are still going to be addressed in the context of a standards-based activity. And it's going to be at the, at the student's grade. So for example, a student activates a device with a pre-recorded word for classmates during an antonym naming game. Now, maybe you're doing this in a small group. The other students are working on antonyms, on and off, up and down. But this student, this student's activating a device. That's what they're doing. They are not doing the antonyms. Here's another one for you. 
As students releases a block from their grasp, the teacher counts as each block drops into the bin. Is the student counting? No. The student is releasing a block. The teacher is counting for that particular domain. So if you think you have a student that is working just at access skill level, you're in luck because we have access skill session on the 16th. So you can go and sign up for that during the break if you didn't know about it or you didn't know you had a student like that. These students have some exceptions that are a little bit trickier and we have just the person to help you with that. So make sure you check that out. So now I wanna see if how clear it is for you. We're gonna do a poll. Think about the students you have. Think about whether they're entry point or working at those, at those developmental milestones. Okay, thank you for participating. And it looks like 67% of you think you have entry points and 26% of you think you have access skill and there's a, a very small percentage that's unclear. So again, hopefully we'll clear that up for you, but I wanna, um, I wanna let you know that that's okay, we'll, we'll be fine. This is what we call a core set of evidence. And if any of you downloaded the um, sample strand for Alex, you will have just this. You'll have a strand cover sheet, a skill survey, and a data chart. It can be any of these data charts, and two pieces of primary evidence, right? And you see underneath, it can be a work sample, a photo, a video. And we talked about this probably too much, but the exception is writing and science and tech. So they have unique requirements, but for ELA reading, language and math, you will have this core set of evidence. <clears throat> and when we were talking about and navigating that resource guide and how we move and spiral down, I said, you, I would show you a way in which you can do that. So this is called a skill survey. Highlightable moment. These skill surveys are required for each strand that goes into the portfolio. Every strand you have will have a skill survey. It's very important. It is required and without it, it can't be scored. So Highlight that, write a note to yourself, put a post-it in your plan book. Every strand has a skill survey. So what is this skill survey? So every strand's a little, every skill survey is a little bit different. In this case, we're doing number and operations base 10. And you can see that there's 12 uh, different skills there. And you're going to look at your student and see what they can and can't do. It's like a pretest. Um, it's it's going to you're going to complete it before you do your entry points. If your student is clearly access skills, you're going to do all A's because they can't do anything. You're going to print this out and you're going to put it behind right after the strand cover sheet in the in the portfolio. It does count as I said if it. If you don't have it, it cannot be scored. So what we're trying to do is make sure that you're familiar with all of the standards and possible entry points. It helps to eliminate some of those that the students already know and kind of narrow down the more challenging ones. Sometimes it has been known to have you go back to your IEP team and say, I'm not really sure that this student should be taking an alternate assessment and participating in it. We also have some new criteria for that, but we'll leave that for another day. So you can do any of these to assess your student. Most people will do observations, informal assessments, 
classroom work. You can create your own tasks. You can use some of the examples that are in the survey form. But right now you're getting to know your student. You're probably giving them some work samples just to get to know them, what their, what their levels are. Use that and you know take a look at the skill survey and see what kind of skills we're looking for and then see what they can do with little support. They may need some support um, and so that'll that will go with this rubric. So if your student can't perform these skills at all, if they're access skills or if they're just not at that level, perhaps you haven't taught the skill yet, they would be an A. But you see up here on D and E, they can do it more often than not without support or most of the time without support. So we don't want those. So we want to take a look at it and see. We don't want to pick anything from D or E. We want to look at the columns A, B, or C because we want to get the correct skill. Also, you, you have the choice of which one you want to do. Once you complete it and you look at those skills, you can pick which one works best for you. So the student may need all of them down here. You know, you can see that there's at least four or even five skills. I would probably wouldn't do that one because they seem like they're pretty close to having that and you don't want to assess a skill that they really already have. But there's four skills here and there's a lot of skills in between each of those as far as entry points go that you could choose. So that's really up to you. It just helps to narrow down your choices. So now we're going to select the measurable outcome. Here's the strand cover sheet. So Alex Keaton, very important that we have that information there. And we talked about, Kevin talked about how important it was to have the right grade because the right grade gives you the right uh, content and strands that you need. So we're in math, if you're grade five, you're gonna do number and operations base 10. Then we're going to look at this measurable outcome. What is this measurable outcome? So this one says, Alex will round whole numbers to the nearest 100 using place value with 80% accuracy and 100% independence. So the measurable outcome is a goal that you choose and it's based on that skill survey you are going to choose either an entry point or an access skill based on your student and depending on the assessment of the grade that's second then you're going to create this measurable outcome and all it means is we're going to take that skill that you've identified and we're going to add some criteria for it for mastery all the evidence in the strand is going to document the performance of your student in that measurable outcome. So this is a star worthy moment, more than highlight. You choose the entry point or access skill. You give it criteria for mastery. Then you document that skill, which we're now calling the measurable outcome on the data chart and in the evidence. And everything is going to circle back to this measurable outcome. The criteria for mastery is what you decide is time to be done with that. So even if you choose 80% accurate and 100% independent, but you know your student is never gonna get there, right? They're gonna be, Maybe if they get to 60% um, independence, you'll be very happy. That is up to you. There is nothing related to the scoring that has to do with what you choose for the criteria for mastery. Okay, so make sure you note that it's, it's out there. 
Somebody who's done them before will say, oh, be careful what you put for mastery. Nope. You can shoot for the moon. We do not have anything as part of um, the scoring where it comes to your criteria. What we do check is that the entry point or access skill that you chose that is now the measurable outcome is documented for that strand. So we want to make sure, and the reason we're doing this is we want to make sure it's challenging, not so challenging that the student's going to rip up the paper or run and hide under the table, but we also don't want it so easy that they're done in 10 seconds and they're bored out of their mind. You don't want to waste their time. You don't want to waste your time. You want to set the bar high. You want to challenge them and you want to make sure it's attainable. You have the time. You have, you can do a unit in a couple of weeks if you're working on, um, say you're working on geometry, you need a couple of weeks for that unit. You can continue to work on that. You don't have to just work on it for MCAS Alt. Remember that this is embedded in your instruction. So maybe you have to look at when you're doing um, this math and how long you want it to be and whether or not your students are understanding it. So you have a lot of autonomy. You just want to make sure that you're challenging your student and that the entry point you chose is right for that student. One thing you do want to look at when you select an entry point is to review the verb. Why do I want to review the verb? Because it depends on how the student is going to do this skill. Are they going to describe it? Are they going to identify it? Are they going to match it? it? Makes a big difference for your student if they're only able to match and not describe. You don't want to describe in that entry point. Also, there are a lot of examples we've provided in those entry points. The math has can be confusing. So we've tried to put examples. We've had our math content person put examples in each entry point um, that we think requires one. But if you're not sure, please, please consult a content expert. There's a lot of things in there. Um, and maybe it's been a while since you taught certain things. But I would go and ask a colleague that's teaching in that grade, even if it's a lower grade, what some of these things are. Ask them for a worksheet. What are you doing on, you know, to teach uh, functions? Can you show me some things that you're using? Most teachers are willing to share. So if you're not sure, it's better to ask than to teach the wrong concept and then have it be um, incomplete because it wasn't the correct concept that you were teaching. Also, there are notes embedded in the resource guide. So they're like little reminders for us. A unit fraction is a fraction with the numerator of one, just a reminder. So if you're doing something like adding unit fractions, you'll know that both of those fractions have to have a numerator of one. And this is gonna be a t-shirt. Remember to assess the entry point or access skill you selected. And it's easy to be a quick clicker. And when Kevin shows you this program, you'll see why. But you want to make sure that you are clicking the one that's right for your students. Because sometimes there's some that are similar. And you just click the first one you see. And then what happens is you're doing something different. So we want to make sure that you're assessing the entry point or access skill that you uh, meant to. So here's some options for you. And again, this is recorded. It's also in our educator's manual. You can see right up at the top of that page, page 26, if you, you forget this. But there's a couple of options. If an entry points has multiple related skill, such as add and subtract, multiply and divide, those are considered related skills. You can use the entry points as is. We recommend that you use 99% of the entry points as is. It'll, it's, it's fine. If you look closely enough, I'm sure you'll find what you need. However, 
Say you find solve multiplication and division word problems. That's the entry point. Remember that entry point becomes a measurable outcome. The measurable outcome now says student will solve multiplication and division word problems with 80% accuracy and 100% independence. That's our criteria. That's my criteria for when I think my student has made it. I might stop before that. Not a problem, but I might continue. That's fine. So that's what I chose as an entry point. I know that my student, we've been working on multiplication. We've been working on division. So now I want to assess them on both. So my brief description says, students solved six multiplication and division word problems on a worksheet. All my work samples, all my data points on my graph are going to have both of those skills. So you're going to solve multiplication and division word problems all the way through. But remember that your, ref your evidence always reflects that measurable outcome, all right? We talked about that t-shirt. Option two. Maybe I have some students who are ready for the multiplication and division word problems and can be assessed. But maybe I have a student that can only do multiplication. But I like this entry point because it says solve multiplication word problems. So I want this one, but I don't want division. Option two, I can create an and I can take that entry point, create my measurable outcome with just one skill. So it says, student will solve multiplication word problems with 80% accuracy and 100% independence. Students solved five multiplication word problems on a separate page, then recorded the answer on the worksheet. So we've changed it from two skills to one skill, my measurable outcome has one skill, all my work samples, all my data points are solving multiplication, word problems, one skill. That's how it's reflected. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin while you absorb that, and he's gonna show us a little bit more on the forms and graphs. Thank you, Deb. So in just a second, I'll, I'll pop back over. Um, and we can start to build out what Deb just showed you. And, and I think it helps connect the dots too. You'll see how the skill survey is related to the cover sheet and how you um, can work with the resource guide to get at the entry points and access skills. Um, but I'm just gonna drop back in the chat those links I'd put in in case you joined us late. Um, so there are those links and I'm gonna switch over. So give me one moment. Okay, so just a quick reminder that those two links, one of them is the materials for the session today. So if you if you joined us late um, and you want the PowerPoint and the sample strand we've been looking at in the PowerPoint, those all live here um, under core concepts. And then again, that DESI page, which is a good one to bookmark the resources tab for MCAS Alt. Right down there at the bottom is that MCAS Alt forms and graphs. So you click that and it'll take you here, which is the login page where we started our little journey with forms and graphs earlier this morning. Reminder, if you've never used it, just go to registration and create a page. Um, but let's log back in and we'll catch up with what Deb just showed you with the, the Alex Keaton sample. So I'm going to sign in. Once you've got a student in your student list, it'll bypass that My Account page where you can put in the information or undelete students. Um, just know in that red bar, you can always click back to it and go back and fill it out if you skipped over it. Um, but once you've got a list going, it'll take you right to your student list. And let's jump in with Alex. So I had mentioned before that you what you will do a majority of the time that you come here is these three at the top. So cover sheet, we've already completed that. Just a quick reminder of, of what that is, is that's where you get that 10 digit SACID and we've locked in our grade and all the demographic information. Um, but now we come to the uh, the real creating of strands. So to do that from the table of contents, these two are linked. So Deb talked about the skill survey, a required element for every strand that you do. Um, so this is where you can create skill surveys. And then 
this is where you create the actual strands. So language, reading, whatever math, we're going to build that number and operations base, base 10 <clears throat> for Alex. Normally, you would do your skill survey first. Always have to do the skill survey. The site will actually stop you from creating a strand. Um, and I'll show that to you. I'm going to do it wrong just to show you if you do it this way, this is what this error is trying to point you to. So I'm going to skip the skill survey for now, and I'm going to try to create a strand. So just a reminder, um, it's in the PowerPoint that Deb was showing too. We're just rebuilding this math base 10 for Alex. So grade five, the number and operations in base 10. So to create a strand, <clears throat> I click strand cover sheet list. And again, it doesn't know, even though it knows it's a grade five, um, it, it will only populate what you tell it to. So until you tell it to build a strand, it won't do that. So to add a new strand, we can click add a new strand. We'll get a placeholder for a strand. And then it'll say content area. And this is the first time you see that filtering I mentioned. So it's a grade five. So I've got ELA, math, and science shows up. So five, eight in high school, I get science. This was a grade four, I couldn't do a science. Um, we know we wanna build a math, so we'll say okay. And again, these are the two that are appropriate for a grade five student. If it was grade four, these would be two completely different strands, two different math domains. So it'll stop you from mixing and matching where you shouldn't. You just can't willy-nilly create any old math strands you want. These are the two that are required for a grade five MCAS alt student. So we know Alex, number operations base 10, and I think I'm going to create my strand and it's going to say, no, thank you. It will force you to do your skill survey first. You cannot get to the strand cover sheet that Deb was showing you um, for Alex until you can the, the linked skill survey, in this case, math number and operations base 10 skill survey for that student. You'll get this every single time. Um, it will not let you go further. So the proper way to do it, we can go back to the table of contents. <clears throat> now this time, let's do the skill survey. So we'll click skill survey. It's kind of like building strands, except we're building skill surveys. Click add a new skill survey. Go to skill survey, filtered again. Um, there are some combos here where ELA reading, um, it doesn't matter if you're doing info or, or literary, it's one skill survey that covers both of those. Writing, there's different text types that are available, but one skill survey covers. Um, but you just want to make sure you match up. Particularly in this one, you've got two math that are named number and operations, and then one's base 10 and one's fractions. Um, I, if I created the fractions and then tried to create a base 10 strand, it's going to tell me that I hadn't completed the skill survey. So you have to match them up. If you're going to do a base 10 strand, you have to do the base 10 skill survey. So we know we want base 10. I click. And now you see a interactive version of what Deb was showing you through the PowerPoint. So this is a grade five number and operations base 10 skill survey. As Deb showed in the sample in the PowerPoint, there's 12 different um, lines that need to have a selection made. So 12 different levels of skills. Um, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's a little bit more. Um, it depends on the strand. But the thing to remember is every single one of these needs a selection. So one through 12. So if they're unable to do it, then that's column A, zero. So this is the percent of how um, independently they could do that that describes skill. So we'll give it a date. There's the third. And then these are all just radio buttons, check marks of, of sorts. So um, you just click off what's appropriate for that student. And then <laughs> The eagle eye of the use that you've missed seven. I'm doing that on purpose. <laughs> so if I thought I completed this, this catches people sometimes. So I just want to point this out to you. If I thought I completed this um, and I go back to my table of contents and I either try to create or try to get into a strand, we have already created it. Um, if I try to get back into this base 10 thinking it's going to let me in, it still won't. Uh, the reason why is because I didn't do, it wanted 12 selections and I skipped number seven. Um, it's easy to do. They're all just lines. Um, you can pop right back to the skill survey here. 
So now I'm back on my skill survey. But now when I go back to it, it'll kind of lead me to what I did wrong. So notice all these are now green, except for number seven. It knows I skipped over number seven. Um, so until I make a selection for all, all 12 of these, and remember, sometimes it's just that they're unable to do it. And if your access skills, pretty much all the time, all of these are going to be column A, because um, they're just at that level where even the lowest skill is, is something they're just unable to do. Um, but once I make a selection, if you save this page up in the red bar, it also performs that little check. Notice it snapped number seven green. Now I know, yep, now I've completed this. I've got a selection for each of these. You can go back to the table of contents. There's a shortcut here to the strands list. So this red bar will take you anywhere you need to go or save or print. Um, so let's go right back to our strands list. Number and operations base 10. And if everything checks out, yay. So now I can see my strand cover sheet. I've completed my skill survey. That's done. And now I can start to build the strand. Um, and we'll just work this from top to bottom. Notice it's populated everything it knows at this point. So Alex Keaton, grade five, what strand, content area are we in? And the first thing we come to is the learning standard. If we look at Alex's sample, we can see line 3C, it's nbt.b.6. So these are all at grade level. Um, so notice they all begin with five. Um, all you get is that ID though to choose from. Um, if you've memorized all the learning standards by their their ID, that's impressive. I'm going to dare guess that most of you do not know that information. So there's a couple of different ways you can get at that. Um, Deb showed you, so on that resources page for DESI, all those resource guides, so math, you could open 300, 400 pages of math and try to find that, that particular page that you're after. But baked right into this system, this little link here, so next to this drop down, if you click resource guide, it'll take that 300 something page document and pluck out just the pages that you're interested in. So a new tab will open up, it'll give me number and operations in base 10 for all the grades um, that it's appropriate for. Uh, you still have to, it's just a PDF, so you still have to scroll. So I'm just scrolly, scrolly, scrolly. Notice as I go, I'm starting to see the entry points. Um, so you can start to think about what you're going to use for your measurable outcome, um, but there's a better way. Um, you can get them right from here, but there's a more powerful kind of interactive way to get that in there that I'll show you in just a second. But for standard, you just go and here's grade five, base 10, all the standards. And we know this one here, B.6 is the one that we're after. So another thing to keep in mind, this catches people. If I just select it, so if I do mbt.b6, if I leave this page and come back, it's going to say select again. It's not locking that in. Um, and just think big red button. Uh, so the big red button next to it that says get LS text, get learning standard text is what that's trying to point out. When you click the big red button, it will find that text and drop it in. So until you see that text dropped in, now when I leave and come back, this is attach. Um, it will stick. Um, but just know if you, you find that you're constantly losing your learning center that you select, just select get LS text and it'll drop in um, and plop it in there for you. It's just locked in. So now we get down to the concept of level of complexity. Are you access skills? Are you entry points? And the all important measurable outcome, the thing that unites all evidence, all data, everything you're doing in that all important measurable outcome. I'm going to skip over this for now, the level of complexity. What this is looking for is for you to say, are you doing an access skill? And of that skill that you selected, what page did you get it from, from the resource guide? Because all these skills need to be um, selected from the resource guide. So either an access skill or an entry point, but I'm, I'll come back to that. So we come now to the all important measurable outcome. It is just a text box. Um, you could just type it in there if you know the skill that you want to do. But the real power of this page is this one button here, find entry points. So it says entry points, it also means access skills, and I'll show you where you can get those. But when I click this, 
this is where it starts to kind of connect that idea of scrolling up and scrolling down and finding the appropriate skills. So now I get an interactive version of the resource guide. So it's not a PDF. I can click on it and, and find higher or lower content. It will always start you at the grade for the student. Um, sometimes it's a grade span, but in this case, we're a grade five for Alex. And it started me at a grade five tab. So these are all the skills that are linked for grade five for the strand that I'm in. And the thing to remember is if you see it on this page, either at a grade five all the way down to kindergarten, these are all appropriate. Um, so it's just about you. They've been pre-filtered for you. Um, it's about finding the level of skill that's appropriate for what you wanna assess for that student. If these are all too high, then you can go to grade four. And these are slightly still aligned to number and um, operations base 10. But at grade four level, this isn't a learning standard. This is the entry point. So lower complexity as we go down in the grades, all appropriate. Sometimes you might need to go all the way down to a grade one or a kindergarten or pre-K. Sometimes they go as low as pre-K. Um, and you'll notice they drop in complexity, count by tens to 100. <clears throat> if you have to go all the way down, if you're, you're working at access skills, where you'll find those is always at whatever the lowest grade level is for the strand. In, in this case, base 10 starts at kindergarten. As I mentioned, sometimes it's pre-K, sometimes it's grade four. It just depends on the strand, what the, the lowest level grade. But when I click, whatever's in this leftmost low, lowest level, you'll notice in this case, kindergarten, access skills now show up. So as soon as you go to the lowest available, you'll see the access skills. And that's where um, the really low functioning students, if, if your skill survey is all zeros, um, a, column A can't do any of them, then maybe you're as low as, but you might be able to find a really low entry point that's appropriate too, but perhaps access skills were appropriate. But the function of this page, regardless of what tab you're on, is, is always the same. It's about finding, and so this is what Deb was mentioning about being a quick clicker. You might scroll down here and see one, round decimals to the nearest 10th and think, yep, that's what I want. Um, but if you just go one grade lower, Maybe there's a subtle difference on that one um, that it will better align with what you know you're going to do with the student. So spend some time clicking around these tabs of going up. You can also go up. Um, very few go higher, but sometimes that particular skill just lives at a slightly higher grade level, say grade six. You can, if it's a tab on this page, they are all open for you to use. They are all vetted. They are all aligned um, for you to use with the strand that you're in. So we know Alex's. Um, that one actually comes from one grade down. So grade four, and the skill he's working on was, I believe it's that one. One second, let me check. So it is round whole numbers to the nearest hundred using place value. So we see it right here, this round whole numbers. To the, and what will happen uh, when I select it, so all these little radio buttons are here for you to click on. You don't have to copy and paste. So when I click, this little radio button next to it. Um, it happens fast, but what, what it'll do is take that skill, take you back to the string cover sheet, tack on Alex Will, grabs the student's first name, and then ends with XX accuracy and XX dependence. So it builds that shell of the measurable outcome for you. Um, so you don't have to type it in. Um, and notice I didn't do four, it'll do it for me. I don't even know, looking at that page, I have no idea what, where I selected it from, what page number from the full resource guide, but the system knows that that came from page 54. So it'll check off entry points for you and put in the page number. So as long as you're using that find entry points, no matter what grade level um, you're selecting from, it will populate this for you. <clears throat> there are certain things I like to call you protect you from yourself features built into this, uh, where um, obviously we don't want to leave XX accuracy and XX independence. Remember this everything is getting printed out and attached to the actual student work that you're you're doing that goes in the binder. So if I try to print this, and we'll cover printing later this afternoon as a whole strand, but like, let's say I wanna print this strand cover sheet. I wanna, we'll catch up to this printing multiple stuff later, but just the strand cover sheet, it's going to yell at me. It's going to say the measurable outcome should not contain XX percentages. So all it's looking for me to do, it is still just a text box. So you can go in, just overwrite those 
XX percentages with real values, the goal that you're working for, um, for that student. Um, and now when I save this and I try to print, I've met at least that minimum requirement. So it's going to strip away everything else and give me a nice clean version of that um, strand cover sheet where my all important measurable outcome is now populated there. So that's the basic, we're gonna stop there um, and then this afternoon when we come back, we'll Deb will talk about building the data charts and the evidence that you sign. That all happens down here at the bottom, um, but we won't, we won't dive that far quite yet. Uh, so just the basic concept of skill survey, all important, do that first, and then how you use this find entry points button to select a, a meaningful skill that you're going to create that measurable outcome with. So I'll leave you there with that and hand it back to Deb, um, who will wrap things up and take some questions. Um, so over to you, Deb. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so you can see how wonderful that program is. And for those of you, if um, ask some of the veteran teachers about how we started when we had to color in our own data charts, um, it'll be, it was very different. So let's get to your questions. I promised that I would answer your questions. Um, I'll take a look. I will read them, that some of the ones. Um, I'm not going to get into district code. We talked about that. Go to your um, go to your office and um, ask them. They can help you, I promise. OK, uh, let's see. So help me out here. Let's see. High school. High school is the alt only done for grade 10 students. So at high school, that's a good question. You are able to do a science for grade nine. It's optional. You don't have to, but some people like to have it done. And then in grade 10, all they have to concentrate on is ELA and math. So that's up to you. Many schools I have noticed are doing the high school though. So each strand, somebody asked how many skills do you need within each strand? So each strand, remember we said you're going to choose an entry point. So that entry point is going to go into a measurable outcome. It's going to turn, we're going to put it on a data chart. And so every strand has one skill. <clears throat> Just trying to look through. The other thing I want to tell you is um, sometimes people think you have one binder for all content areas, okay? So just make sure you remember that. One one binder, all, all students' material. And Kevin will talk about this later this afternoon, but you can have, especially middle school, high school, you may have two people working on the same student. So feel free to create two um, accounts because it's only what you print out is what we see, okay? For access skills, don't forget we have that wonderful session on the 16th, I believe it is, that you can sign up for. And any question that's about your student, I think it'd be better if you spent some time and send sent me the direct email. Can students show an increase in independence rather than accuracy? That's a good question. So it would be um, errorless teaching and you're just working on the independence. Yes, that's fine. You want to make sure that at least um, you don't want to start out with both being at 80 or 100. So if one is zero and one is 100, that's fine. So we'll talk about that a little bit more this afternoon when we get into the actual data charts. We're going to talk about, um, someone's asking about independence level and accuracy. Um, remember I said you don't need to have it at 80% for the criteria. We'll talk about how you actually calculate accuracy and independence, but for the criteria and mastery, that's up to you. You can make it 80%, you can make it 75%. You can shoot for the moon and make it 100% independent, even though you know that won't happen. There is no no foul there. There's no, there's nothing that's going to happen if you put 100% independent and the student gets to 60. 
Okay, maybe that's a great thing for that student. Okay, great. I I will, um, I don't want to keep you. I appreciate the fact that you showed up on time. I will stay in and help answer questions, but I'll go off. I'm going to go off camera and I'll mute myself, but I'll see you all back here at um, 1.30. So make sure you pop back at 1.30. All right. So thank you for showing up. I'll see you at 1.30. I will continue to answer questions and anything that I think needs to be reviewed when we get back, I will do that. So have a nice lunch. I'll see you later.